Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Skinner, for anyone who doesn't already know me. I'm founder of Marketing Kind, and welcome to this evening's Marketing Kind Exchange, in which we'll be exploring how we can script our way to a safer world. Now, for as long as I can remember, humanitarians and other people with responsibilities for dealing with disasters and emergencies have argued that because crises can affect all of us, we need to unlock more whole of society approaches to dealing with them. I actually wrote about this in passing in my first book, Collaborative Advantage, um, through the lens of doing more to make a humanitarian of everyone. Now that came out in 2018, but fast forwarding to today, and of course, in the wake of a global pandemic that has truly impacted all of us, whether or not we contracted COVID, um, in the shadow of conflict in Europe and elsewhere, with the rising threat multipliers of the climate emergency, the collapse of more of nature's important systems, you know, extreme weather events such as are, are hitting um, the United States this week, um, with powerful new technologies that pose dangerous, unprecedented threats, as well as creating opportunities. Maybe now is at last the time when self-interest might be able to provoke us to doing more to make that a reality. Now, narrative is going to be essentially essential and crucial to that. Um, even in the case of a disaster or an emergency, you can argue that the direct and unavoidable impacts of most disasters um, is less great than the cumulative impact of the narratives that collectively shape how we anticipate, prepare for, respond to and recover from that disaster and emergency. But what kind of narratives will help us individually, organisationally and culturally uh, better prepare to contend with a more dangerous world? Well, we could hardly be in better company to find out because we are joined by someone who has experienced both of the front line of disasters and emergencies, um, but also has spent an enormous amount of time and dedicated a huge talent to working through how we can better script our way through those emergencies, Dr. Melka Older. Um, among her creative writing, um, her novel Infomocracy, was um, named by the Washington Post as one of the best books of the year. It was also described in the Huffington Post as one of the greatest literary debuts in recent history, uh, which is a marvellous phrase. Um, and along with its sequels, um, Null States and State Tectonics forms the Sentinel Cycle trilogy that was also shortlisted for the uh, prestigious Hugo Best Series Award. Um, Melka's journalism, has also featured in everything from mainstream media such as the New York Times to foreign policy magazine and very specialist media um, such as the, the highly important and influential Bulletin of Atomic Scientists that for anyone who doesn't know is also the group behind the Doomsday Clock. Um, she also has a, over a decade of frontline experience directly responding to disasters and emergencies on the ground in Sri Lanka, Uganda, Darfur, Indonesia, Japan, and Mali. Um, she's taught both humanitarianism and predictive writing that we'll hear more about at Arizona State University. And her career in journalism has recently taken a, a new step forward as she's become executive director of Global Voices. So welcome to Marketing Kind, Malka. How are you feeling this afternoon? <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to be here. It's great. Um, and I'm feeling, you know, good individually and looking at the world with some some concern. Yeah. And we're going to hopefully dive quite deeply into some of those concerns. Um, I wonder just to begin with, to set the scene, um, as we have a, a generalist group, could you sort of bring to life for us the kind of situations that you were working in uh, when you were working as an aid worker, the kind of context you were facing and the kind of activities that, that you were leading that is, is such an important backdrop to your work. Sure. Uh, so I worked for international uh, non-governmental organizations for about 10 years in a variety of contexts. Um, some of them were very much emergency contexts. So I worked um, after the 
tsunami in Sri Lanka, which was actually how I got into emergencies because I was already living in Sri Lanka, working for a local NGO at that time. Uh, I worked on the complex long-term emergency of Darfur, which mm. unfortunately is again uh, having a lot of a lot of difficulties. Um, and responded to earthquakes in Indonesia, the tsunami in Japan, um, conflict in Mali. Uh, in between, I was also doing a lot of sort of longer term development or poverty mm. reduction or uh, various kinds of um, peace building programming in a lot of these places and some others. And uh, eventually kind of did some things that, that brought the two together by working in a lot of disaster risk reduction and disaster preparedness. Yeah. So, well, one thing I'm particularly interested in is because you were leading operations that are massively practical, mm. massively hands on, almost by definition. I mean, so perhaps let's say with the disaster risk, risk reduction, because a lot of that, you know, you're getting left of bang, essentially. <laughs> so you're helping to prevent something or avoid something. But nevertheless, it's all very practical and material approaches to change. But then I, I guess there must have been a moment or a period of time during which you began to become somewhat frustrated with that model and with the model of aid and began to perceive that in some ways what was most holding us back were the underlying narratives that were causing people to need those kind of aid responses in the first place and that you know maybe there were alternative approaches to creating change you know, it was is that kind of a, a a process that you went through and how did that play out in your mind if so uh i mean yes and no i think i would frame it a little bit differently than that i i think that you know there is a lot of frustration inherent in working in the aid industry where you know we are taking money that is given from either rich people or rich governments to try and assist situations that are largely caused by actions, if not of those people and those governments, then by their predecessors. Um, sometimes, you know, these are byproducts of their actions. They're not intentionally, but it's been going on long enough that we all know um, that these things are are the results. And so, yeah, I mean, it is, it is sometimes feels, and I think well, and when I most clearly started to feel this, I was working in, in Darfur in Sudan, which was, you know, obviously a it, this was quite a long time ago, so I'll just say briefly, you know, there was a, a lot of um, conflict and uh, uh, suffering being caused in Darfur, a lot of it by the Sudanese government, some also by other actors, um, including neighboring governments and, and militias that had some degree of approval from the government, but were also somewhat independent, so on. So there was a lot going on. And we, you know, we were there as aid agencies on the sufferance of the Sudanese government. They had a fair amount of control over whether mm -hmm. we got visas, whether we were allowed to stay there, what kind of activities we did. Uh, some, And it was quite, um, you know, there were officials in the small towns where I worked who would talk to me about, you know, what programs are you doing? And on the one hand, you know, we were doing things very directly with people who were very happy to have extra blankets or a program that built latrines and so on. On the other hand, it sometimes felt like, um, like we were a bit of a, not just a band-aid, but also a bit of cover for the government, for the entire international system, you know, to say, okay, these bad things are going on here, but see, NGOs are in there working on it. The government has let them in. Uh, people are working to alleviate these problems. So we don't have to actually make any of the expensive or difficult decisions that would really change the paradigm of the situation. And that was a pretty, you know, especially clear example. Uh, but it's, it is pretty much what the, what the, the shape of the, the industry is. And, you know, I, I have, still so much respect for the people who work in in international assistance whether it's long term whether it's emergency the vast majority of the people that i met working in this were really doing the right thing for for the right reasons and trying very hard to make things better for people 
And I don't have a whole lot of confidence that if we suddenly stop doing that, the international community would say, oh, the, there's no NGOs anymore. We should cha make changes. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and so for the individuals who are most affected, obviously having that aid is better than nothing. But yes, I mean, you definitely feel, uh, I, I am not sure that I would put all the blame onto narratives. I think that there's a lot of blame to be put on power structures and hierarchies and entrenched wealth and privilege of all sorts of different kinds, um, as well as a kind of um, willful ignorance in favor of comfort and inertia. Uh, but I, it, it is certainly very frustrating. Yeah, um, and of course, other people have written very persuasively about um, how aid can be used as a cover um, how aid enables governments to continue and appear to be doing something without tackling the underlying causes. But as you say, at the same time, at the point at which aid is delivered, there is a, an urgent need. And so in a sense, I suppose there's a need to both deliver direct support and tackle the underlying systemic issues. Um, now, of course, you've switched to writing um, and so that's already a different mechanism for achieving change. But you haven't just switched to writing, you've switched to so many different modes of writing. I mean, you've, you're writing academically, you're writing journalistically, you're writing as a novelist, um, you're writing as a poet and short story writer. What have been the opportunities, challenges and frustrations of moving from achieving change on the ground and directly seeing the people that you're supporting to working in such a variety of discourses to achieve change where so much of the change that you achieve is you're, you're not even gonna see the people reading your books most of the time. So what have been the challenge? How has how's the sort of Malka Older theory of change evolved as you've changed your mode of operating? Well, it's 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 certainly a difference. And even having all those uh, feelings that I do about the way that the aid industry works, um, particularly when I had just left it and I was working on my PhD, which is, you know, notoriously mm -hmm. abstracted from reality and far from any actual impact on the world. Uh, and, you know, and I hadn't I hadn't published my books yet either at the beginning of that. I definitely struggled quite a bit with going to places and interviewing people about disasters that had happened and, mm. you know, going from doing those sort of conversations where with an eye to, okay, what programs can we build and hopefully get money to fund to, to do something about this to I'm going to write a very long scholarly screed uh, that, you know, someone might read. And that, that was, that was honestly, it was quite emotionally challenging. Uh, for a while and it took some time to sort of make that shift in my head and you know part of the reason that I did want to go and do a doctorate was not just the sort of industrial um frustration that we talked about but also the the thought that it is important sometimes to step back from the uh the constant sort of firefighting the okay you know there's there's this organizational emergency and this real emergency and we have to fix this and we have to apply for that. And, you know, I, it was part of it was really, let's, let's stop and think for a second and look at it because my, my PhD is uh, quite focused on disaster response. Mm -hmm. um, specifically the response to Katrina and the response to the tsunami in Japan. Um, so it was, it was still quite, quite, you know, tied into these questions. Um mm -hmm. It is a it 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 is very frustrating also to have these huge steps between doing the research, eventually publishing something, and then this this real real gap there between whether what you publish will have an impact on policymakers or really on anyone else. Um, and yet, you know, I I still think it's it's worth having people who are in a position to take the time to do long slow research because you learn things that way that you don't learn other ways. Um, and, you know, we have lots of people in the world with different aptitudes and different 
uh, mm -hmm. needs in their lives for for types of work. So I, I think that it's really valuable to have academic research going on. And I think we should fund more of it and have more people doing it. Uh, but yes, having that 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 stretch and thinking about how to get from from understanding something or writing something to what are the policy implications to how do you convince people to do it? And I'm not going to say that my novels came out of that frustration because I've always written books and always wanted to be a writer of fiction specifically. So that was, you know, that was just me. <laughs> but because I think a large part of the way I relate to the to the world and learn about the world is through reading fiction. Mm -hmm. It made sense to me to channel some of my interests and thoughts and annoyance at the way the world works and hopes and ideas for how it could work differently into fiction and write the books. And okay, in some ways you have an even bigger gap there because for people mm -hmm. to take seriously a novel to make policy changes is a larger leap than a, a doctoral dissertation. On the other hand, more people read it for sure. Uh, and one thing that, that I will say for technology and specifically for social media is that you do get quite a bit of the dopamine of people saying, oh, I read your book and I loved it. And uh, that's really nice. Um, it doesn't necessarily get to policy change or even behavior change, um, but sometimes it does. And sometimes people tell you about what it means to them. And, you know, sometimes also just uh, um, one of the great things I think about literature is the feeling of connection mm -hmm. with someone else when you are reading something that just resonates on the same notes that you are feeling in your head right and so when someone tells you that that happens that's i mean that's a great a great feeling and the question of behavior change isn't necessarily important to that it's just that that connection human connection i think is also just a really important thing in and of itself well i i can say that uh, i'm very grateful that you've written in democracy and your other novels um and i certainly love them as a reader and i want to dive into those in, in a moment um just dwelling on on writing as a mode of change for for a second to what degree has the sort of because in a sense my perception is you've got such a diversity of output with all of these different forms and actions and yet there appears to be quite an underlying sort of unity of perspective in a way. You know, has there, to what degree has your own learning evolved by sort of triangulating between the different modes? You know, because on the one hand, you've got um, you know, books like the novels. On the other hand, you've got quite specific journalistic articles. For example, you know, we're a group, very, we're very interested in narrative and and framing. So maybe you could talk us through the logic of how, for example, there might no, be no such thing as a natural disaster, which is the theme of one of your articles. And to what degree um, are you triangulating your knowledge? So in a sense, when you turn to writing fiction or when you turn to your journalism, you're both drawing on, but also informing your, your background in, in, in hands-on. Um, delivery of response and preparation um, for for risk reduction activities. Well, that, I mean, that's a really it's a really great question, um, and it's something that I have definitely been learning as I've I've gone along. Because, you know, when I started doing my dissertation, I really thought, okay, you know, now I'm an academic and I need to write in this academic mode with some distance, and it's. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's you know I'm I'm not gonna be bringing in my uh, background of of what I think about having done disaster response and and my um, my advisor to is who's a wonderful um, advisor and academic he said no you have to you this is stuff that you know just because you don't know it academically doesn't mean you don't know it what you have to do is explain your position and where you're coming from so that that's clear to people and I think that's such a such an important counterpoint to all the ideas of neutrality and, and objectivity that we have, because we have to recognize that you cannot be perfectly neutral and objective. And you also shouldn't just throw out life experience or other kinds of knowledge um, just because they don't quite fit what you're talking about or opinions for that matter, or emotions. What you have to do is try to be as transparent about them as you can so that people can use that as part of how they evaluate what you're putting forward. And mm -hmm. You know, further from that, when I started publishing novels, uh, it felt like 
you know, I started out feeling like that was a, a different thing from my academic writing. And then I started getting invited to academic con conferences or, or partially academic conferences on the basis of my novels and not my academic work, partly because my academic work was still very nascent at that time. And, and people wanted to talk to me about my ideas uh, much in the way that that they they would as as to an academic or to to someone who was um, involved in in, in nonfiction efforts around that, which was great because I did as I you know for, for me that was part of a way of getting my ideas out. So I was glad that that worked, um, but it also meant really starting to think about how these two things come together and and really three because there is the practitioner background and now you know moving back into into working for. A, an international non-governmental and international nonprofit with global voices, um, which again is, is partly something that I was going back to because I didn't miss being a little bit more direct um, and a little bit more engaged directly in the world on the issues that I care about. Uh, and again, you know, I go into that thinking that it's uh, very much about my previous NGO experience, my previous management experience and fundraising experience. And so many people really want to talk about non -fic my fiction, my science fiction, my books, um, and, and sometimes the academic work as well. They really all intersect and inform each other. And so, you know, for me, it's been a very interesting learning experience in terms of how to think about those interactions, how to think about the places where uh, they contribute to the same thing. Um, how to consider the places where you do have to carve out small separations um, for conflict of interest reasons, if nothing else. Um, obviously writing science fiction isn't the same as writing an academic article. For me, it feels very different in terms of the process as well. Uh, but keeping in mind that we need imagination about the future when we think about what are we going to study? How are we going to research it? Um, and we need I, I really strongly think we need some evidence grounding when we write fiction, because we need to be writing from our experiences, the experiences of people close to us who have told us their stories, not from tropes and trite things that we've seen a million times on TV. That's not experience. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and when we work as well, we need to, in, in engaging with, with, the problems in the world. We also need absolutely to be using our imagination and our, our evidentiary rigor. So they do all, all come together. Yeah. And something I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to get into is my suspicion that from a certain perspective, it's not necessarily the case. It, it, it may be the case that in some ways, friction, fiction may be in some ways a superior pathway to truth than the nonfiction in, from certain perspectives. Um, certain it, perspectives and certain kinds of truth, absolutely. Yeah, particularly when we're when we're writing nonfiction, we're obviously usually advocating for something, whereas fiction, in some ways, is an easier medium for us to explore the shadow side of things, even that 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 we believe in. And actually, on that note, we had one of our prior exchanges with another best-selling novelist, Manda Scott, and she developed the notion of through topia where her novels, which are also now focused on social change, um, actually begin in the present and we work our way through the present moment to a future destination. And she contrasts this through topia with either utopia or dystopia that start with an endpoint. She's interested in how we get from where we are. Now, the Sentinel Cycle trilogy um, and and most of the stories in and other disasters as well, of course, are set in the future. I mean, the Sentinel Cyber Trilly is approximately 50, 60 years in the future, something like that. So to what degree is that really an imagination as to what life will be like in 50 years? And to what degree is it a commentary on the challenges and opportunities that we face today? Really mostly the latter. And when I started writing that book, I actually had to take a moment for myself because I started writing and I had I had a moment when I thought, I can't imagine what things will be like in 50 years. I can't predict it. Things have changed so much in the past 50 years. I, you know, it's I don't know what technology is coming around the corner. And I had to 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 kind of think to myself, really, you're not trying to predict it. 
I'm not trying to tell you what the future is going to be like. And that freed me up to be um, much more creative about the story that I was trying to tell, which is very much about the present. Now, there are, I think, some, some subplots, some technologies, some things in it that do involve me sort of thinking, okay, what will this look like? Mm -hmm. uh, but most of it is me saying, okay, this is the kind of world I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And then I had a lot of fun thinking, how is that world going to look in different places around the world or in different mm -hmm. contexts or for different segments of society or, you know, young people, old people in different, this, these ways. I mean, that was a blast. Uh, but really I was trying to present a contrast to the world the way it is today in a way that I hope makes people think, oh, so it doesn't actually have to be like this. Oh, we could make maybe not all the changes, maybe not change things to exactly the same degree, but we could tweak things in this direction. We could adjust things. We could make changes in the way that that we run the world. Mm. And, you know, it's possible. Things could be different. That's what I'm trying to say with a lot of my science fiction uh, along various different axes. Yeah, and I think it's one of the the the... I suppose one of the dangerous side of stories is once once we're no longer thinking of a story, it goes into our subconscious and starts to form our assumptions. And we tend to think that then, no, you know, that means we can no longer question it. And I suppose one of the dimensions of fiction is that it can enable us to question our assumptions. Um, something that we assume quite a lot is that we live in nation states and they will continue. Um, Yuval Noah Harari, the historian, reminds us that the notion of a nation state is a story as much as many other things are stories and that they're not real objects. Um, Infomocracy, the, the, the first novel of the trilogy, of course, Infomocracy is a portmanteau of information and democracy. So let's tackle it from, from both ends, beginning with, with democracy. Um, you build a world in which the nation state is primarily a thing of the past and that there is a new not quite global order but majority global order of micro democracy where we're organized into sentinels of a hundred thousand people per sentinel and every sentinel can choose whichever government they want um most sentinels are picking sort of two or three fairly obvious candidates um, a legacy candidate, uh, an evidence-based policy candidate, and so on, a uh, party, and so on. Um, interestingly, there are government, NGO, and corporate interests in those governments. But also, with it being a micro-democracy, they're free to choose any of a couple of thousand options. And so you have one or two sentinels doing unusual, think unusual things like a sort of pastiche re recreation of, of the United States in one sentinel, another sentinel that is massively into cosplay. Uh, why wouldn't you be? Um, but it's a very interesting new system of, of 100,000 people will select uh, the government that's right for them and there's no longer a nation state. Now, we happen to have done a recent uh, an exchange previously with Andy Burnham, who's mayor of um, Manchester as a city region, which would be equivalent to about five sentinels. But nevertheless, you know, something we explored with him is that the nation state in some ways is too small to tackle global problems like the climate emergency, but too big to really understand our local interests. And so he was a powerful advocate of devolution. You know, the, the micro-democracy that you describe, is it a reality that attracts you and that you'd like to see come into being? Is it just a thought experiment? Is it something that you'd be scared of? You know, how should we be thinking about micro-democracy and, and the future of our democratic systems? Well, I'll start with saying that I think moving away from the nation state system is something that attracts me a lot because I have immense frustrations um, with how we run things now. Uh, and which immense, immense, lots of different reasons that I think this is a terrible system uh, that we should do something about. And obviously, you know, and I, I think in the book, there's quite a lot of interaction between characters who are thinking between the sort of, oh, we, we make things happen incrementally and burn it all down. And this is definitely different parts of me going, we should burn it all down. No, no, let's take things slow because chaos and people and so on. Um, 
So, you know, I, I realize that changing the nation state system is a tall order and yet it's, it's really terrible for a lot of things. Um, mm -hmm. So we should, we should do that. In terms of micro democracy itself, I mean, even in, in the books and I don't want to give you any spoilers, so I'll be cautious because I know you haven't finished the third one yet, but I, I like this idea of the throughtopia and because I also do not uh, want to write either utopias or dystopias. I find them kind of narratively uh, boring and, and problematic in a lot of ways as well. But I, you know, in the book itself, this is considered part of a continually evolving system because our systems are always evolving. There's no perfect system and there never will be because things change. Uh, so even if something is perfect for one brief shining second, things are going to change around it. Technology is going to change. Demographics are going to change. People's ideas are going to change. Uh, so we need to keep trying to make things better without thinking that there's an end point. I think that a lot of the problems with that we're facing in, in terms of democracy today come from the idea that, oh, once you're a democracy, that's the happy ending. It's like getting married in Elizabethan play. It's over. We, we found the good place. No, we need to keep working to make things better um, and, and also to guard against the way that uh, people, interests, organizations, particularly those that have power, will use the system as they learn it, game the system increasingly to to further entrench their power and to, to expand. Um, so for me, micro-democracy, there are definitely some attractive things about it, it's, but it's not supposed to be, you know, oh, this is where we should definitely go. <laughs> it's supposed to be, we should definitely not stay where we are. We need to change things and we need to find ways to make it better. And it, I think the way that I describe micro-democracy in the book's addresses kind of pointedly a lot of the problems that I see in the in the nation state system. So it's it is kind of trying to to point out those specific some of those specific issues, um, such as, you know, the obsession with territory, which is, you know, has has some grounding in reality, but also at this point in in the world economic history and is is a little bit antiquated. The obsession with uh, immigration, which makes no sense under any terms that you think about it. But, you know, in, in a system where people are thinking about population instead of territory, it's that that obsession just flips. People want more people to come in, mostly um, in most of the Sentinels uh, with, you know, the the just the this idea of of being locked into a geography where you're born pretty much. Um, so a lot of these these issues come up, of course, the the questions of, as you say, uh, you know, local interests and uh, the way that non-majority groups or um, in some cases, you know, non-in-power groups are can be treated really badly by nation states in our current system without there being any particular uh, repercussions or, or legal recourse for that. Um, the way that people who are stateless are really left with with no recourse for anything in our current system um, because and the problems with political analysis. I could go on and on. So I'm going to stop. But, uh, you know, I, I think that there are certainly aspects of micro democracy that we could actually implement pretty easily that would be beneficial in some ways. But I definitely did not intend it to be like, oh, this is the great system we should all be moving towards. It's yeah. it's really much more of a way to show up the problems with here and say that, okay, this is one way we could change it. There are lots of other ways. There are lots of variations on this, um, but we need to start thinking about why we are running a system that misfunctions in all of these ways. Yeah. And of course, the other ways in which the system misfunctions is if, if we look at the other, start at the other end of the picture with, with information. Um, and of course, you know, with the kind of global problems we face today, you know, information is our friend in that we need to understand them if we're going to tackle them. At the same time, the World Economic Forum um, has suggested that misinformation and the climate emergency are the two greatest contemporary global risks. Um, and of course, in the book, information is somewhat of a protagonist in that there is a, an organisation called information, <laughs> uh, which is sort of, um, would it be fair to describe as a cross between Google and the United Nations, 
that has as a mission to inform the global population that participates in micro democracy so that there is something of a factual shared situation and analysis for decision making but of course it has its own troubles um how do we make sure that information literally and in your novels and and in life is our friend and that we don't you know at a time of cognitive warfare polarization in politics how, how do we amplify the good that information can do in our in shaping our narratives um empirically and 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 how do we avoid the pitfalls that we seem to be currently falling into uh it's a it's a great question that i have a lot of answers to but i'm going to start by saying actually one of the inspirations for information was uh a it was during a disaster response an earthquake response that i was working in west sumatra in 2009 um and unhcr brought in an information management officer and it was this one guy who stayed in the um, governor's office, large building, and he had all these maps and he had all this data. And whenever, you know, we would be going out to the field to try to figure out where the damages were and what, what places needed more help. And we would come back and tell him and he would sort of plot it on the maps and he would give out information to us. And it was for me, you know, at the time, maybe because we also had... Um, IOM running some, uh, a sort of pool of transport vehicles as well to say, you know, if you need a truck to take goods somewhere, you sign up and we'll give you a truck. So it was this sort of outsourcing or almost, you know, making public of these services, right? Auxiliary services. And it really made me start to think about information as a public good. Um, and thinking about the way that information uh, underpins so much of what we do, much as electricity does, for example, power. Um, obviously, telecommunications very related, uh, but uh, you know, it just is such a fundamental part, and increasingly so, of of our world. I also wanted to say that neither misinformation nor disinformation are new, and they've been going on in various dynamics for <laughs> thousands of years, for sure. Um, can look at the graffiti in Pompeii if you want to see some examples. And it, and they have absolutely been used specifically uh, to affect democracies. I mean, you can look at the Remember the Main campaign by the Yellow Press, uh, which was, I don't know, 18 what? Ninth, early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, and that's just one example. I mean, there's so many examples if you look back at history of how this has been weaponized over and over again. Uh, and so, you know, I think what we need to do rather than saying, can we end this <laughs> very human process, uh, very incentive driven process, we can look instead at the dynamics that make it particularly dangerous and virulent at different mm -hmm. times. And there are a lot of those going on right now. Um, one thing that is fundamentally important and that I think we need to consider as really an essential part of democracy is education, good education, along with good sources of information are necessary because what's the point in letting people choose if they don't have a basis to make that choice? Uh, so I think when we look at the ways that public education, that higher education are being mm -hmm. attacked, are being cut, we need to remember that places that do not have good public education should not be considered democracies. Uh, I really, I mean, I, I don't actually think that a lot of these people will feel shame at being called non-democracies at this point, but I, I think that we need to be making this connection. Mm. Make sure we understand how vital this is, not only for you know general human good, because everyone should have an education regardless. But if we are going to be calling ourselves democracies, we need to make sure that that is a priority uh, that gets resourced. Um, but beyond that, then when we look at education, and, and certainly, especially when we look at the sources of information, when we look at our media, if you say, how do we want to make sure that they are doing good things for us, that they are friendly to us, uh, that they're positive for the world in general, we, we need to look at the power structures and the funding structures that are driving them. 
um, at the incentives, but also at the control. And it's, you know, it's quite clear when we look at the major media companies today that they are increasingly, you know, large agglomerations, mm -hmm. that they are less and less uh, local organizations. And, you know, local organizations, local news organizations, there's risks there too. I mean, you can certainly have uh, places where there's a local news organization that has no check on it, right? But a lot of places um, would have, even small cities would have at least two newspapers, if you look back in the past before local news was gutted. Um, they would often have two radio stations or more um, to have at least some semblance of, of opposing viewpoints. And you know, which also tells us, by the way, that echo bubbles are not a new social media thing. Uh, when I was growing up in Boston, you had a pretty good idea of which side of the political divide a family was based on which of the local daily newspapers they got, right? So that was already some something of an echo bubble there. But yeah. it has shifted from, you know, a daily newspaper that you get once to 24-hour cable news um, and radio just kind of blaring constantly. And those, you know, that are owned by large corporations that really have an interest in keep, keeping people hooked on watching or listening continuously and have used, you know, massive amounts of money and capital to figure out ways to continue doing that. Um, so go ahead. Well, I, I, it, 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 you, you kind of tapped into one of my sort of deepest fears, actually. <laughs> um, uh, so this might be a little bit of a riff. So bear with me, but um, the, one of the lead characters in the novel has something that you've described as a narrative disorder. Um, and in a sense, this takes me to the heart of an earlier question around, can you get to truth in some ways more effectively through fiction? Um, we've had a lot of brilliant guests in our exchange series at, at Marketing Kind. And what I found with them generally is that there is rarely any error in the internal logic of the case that they make for whatever sustainable future they're, they're pitching. The danger is in the shadow side of what they're not covering. So for example, a lot of people looking at a much more progressive on approach to migration, on sustainability issues, on climate change, are not necessarily factoring in how we're gonna invest in defense in a world that is likely to have more conflict. Um, and I, I just wonder if, in a sense, we all have a narrative disorder. <laughs> I mean, when in one of your stories in And Other, Other Disasters, which I particularly love, um, there's a reference to Don Quixote. And of course, Don Quixote maybe has a, a narrative disorder in that he's read an awful lot of chivalric romance and ends up believing he is the hero of a chivalric romance and he's a knight errant. And so, of course, he goes tilting at windmills. But there is a, an often overlooked scene where he's actually for once in genuine danger. Um, and as soon as he's in genuine danger, the act drops, the mask falls, and he asks for help. And, and I think that in a sense, as humans, we know that our stories are false, but they're also adaptive. You know, I saw my mum a couple of weeks ago and I told her she was the best mum in the world. And for me, that story is true, but I'm not expecting to justify the case for that to 8 billion people across the world as to specifically why my mum is better than theirs. Okay, so in a sense, it's true to me. And I know that there is a perspective where that truth is more questionable. Um, and, and you know, we, we all operate as if we're going to live forever, as if everything we are doing is really super important and so on. Um, the danger, though, is what happens when our stories become too powerful so that the shadow side is too dangerous. And I just wonder whether, you know, in a sense, our slow response to the climate emergency that arguably we've known about since the late 1930s, is a failed dress rehearsal for a failed response to the power of disruption that could be caused by AI. <laughs> you know, to what degree is the shadow side of our narratives becoming just too destructive? Is there a way out of that? 
Okay. Um, great, like wide set of questions here. Uh, so I'm going to start with talking more about narrative disorders as an idea, um, mm. because I think it is a, a useful idea for thinking about. Um, it is, it, it is in the 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 way that I frame it in the books. Um, it is meant to be something that pretty much everyone has, um, with maybe some exception. It's kind of, you know, like the Kinsey scale. Okay. You're, you're, you're on a scale from, there are a couple of people who have no narrative disorder. There are a couple of people who really have no idea, um, of the difference between fiction and reality. Most of us are somewhere in the middle. Right. Uh, and I should say too, you know, that there are two kind of main symptoms or parts of the narrative disorder. Uh, one of them is addiction to narrative. And I think we see that. I certainly see it myself. This is why I wrote about it. But, you know, we have access to so many stories. And we we could not read all the books that are available to us instantly on our phones or e-readers from a library or physically going to the library. Mm -hmm. We could not watch everything that is available online for streaming. It's not physically possible. Um and yet we want more and more and more, uh, sometimes from our favorite authors or auteurs, um, sometimes just to fit what we want in that moment. We need stories. And, and we're seeing that production of stories happening uh, to such an extent that, you know, we, we are so um, inured and so uh, trained in certain narrative tropes that... Mm -hmm. A lot of times you'll watch a 15 second commercial that expresses a narrative arc just within that, sometimes with no words, just showing us. And we know, we recognize it and we understand the story it's telling us, not because it's some universal story, but because it's a story that we in our culture and time specifically have seen over and over again in variations. And the cues are the same ones that we're used to. And so we put it together. We put in the the, the things that are missing in those 15 seconds, our brains supply them just as when, you know, the blind spot in your eye is fixed by your brain. Um, and so this leads to the second part of narrative disorder, which is people who confuse these narrative tropes with real life, you know, so that you uh, try to get into a taxi with someone and you feel like it's a meet cute, even if it's not really cute or you um, expect sometimes uh, bad things to happen because you're alone in the house and it's a dark and stormy night. Even if you've been alone in the house on dark and stormy nights lots of times and nothing bad has ever happened, it still feels creepy because we've been trained this way. Um, and so obviously, yeah, this comes from from, from me, <laughs> my brain uh, doing these things and and really thinking about how overwhelmed and saturated we are with narratives at this point in history. So again, you know, I would say that everyone has some, I'm going to just point out the one in the beginning of this question that you said, which was a, a future that would, that we would need to think about defense in a future that would likely have more conflict. But yeah. I wonder why you think it is likely that there would be more conflict uh, and that that is part of a narrative of some kind um, that has a certain kind of cause and effect uh, balance in it. But, you know, I think that for me, the the question around narrative disorder specifically is, uh, it's not that we're telling ourselves stories because we're we, this is part of what makes us human. We're always going to tell stories. Um, stories are how we get to collective action and stories are how we uh, help ourselves get through the the terrifying existential crisis that it is to be human and stories are how we um talk to our families and how we remember how we remember things the problem i think um certainly the problem that i'm addressing with narrative disorder specifically is when certain tropes become overwhelming and those become things that people do internalize and start to believe are real uh, so, for example, one that that works really well with my particular expertise in disaster response. If you watch a disaster movie, it is almost certainly going to have a scene of mass panic. People are screaming and running uh, and people are, are freaking out and not able to think about what they should do. People are often uh, and usually certain types of people are often breaking windows and grabbing things. 
this does not actually happen. Uh, there is lots and lots and lots of disaster literature showing that this does not happen. I can also say, you know, from my own experience of being in situations where I really expected bad things to happen <laughs> and along those lines, and they absolutely did not, um, which I can talk about in more detail if you want. But overall, there's just tons of evidence saying this doesn't happen. Do people run and scream? Sometimes if there's something to run away from, like if Godzilla does come out of the ocean, you should run and maybe scream. Uh, if, you know, and there, there are other more realistic examples where people should run, but people generally do not panic. Um, they generally do not loot unless there's a situation where stores are closed and food are going bad and it's been three days and no one has come with any assistance, then of course they're going to loot. Mm. Um, occasionally, yes, people will take major electronics, but it's not the sort of thing that happens a lot. Um, violence after disaster is very, very rare, um, except in the cases of uh, governments who say that, that they should shoot looters on site, for example. Um, so mostly this this doesn't happen. And yet we have seen it in so many movies and TV shows over time that it feels like something that should happen. Um, it feels like something that we know is true. And so that is where I think there's really a problem. And I want to say too, when I say tropes, it's not just uh, things that we can talk out like, like a sequence like that. It's also things about like, what do certain kinds of professions look like? There's a certain kind of uh, appearance that is always cast as an accountant in movies, for example, or that annoying middle manager, or, mm -hmm. and that's not true. We all know that's not true. And yet when you see enough movies like that, if you start to think, oh, I'm going to write, I'm going to describe an accountant in my new book, and you start to, to describe it in a certain way. And of course, it gets much more pernicious when we're not talking about accountants, but we're talking about gangsters, for example. Um, or people who are violent and scary. And so there's, uh, you know, there's different degrees of obviousness or subtlety on this. There's different degrees of complexity to the kinds of tropes or stories that I'm talking about here. But the, the unifying problem to them is when it's repeated over and over again when there's a kind of laziness around storytelling. And again, I'm not only talking about movies or TV shows or books, I'm also talking about uh, the kind of feature articles that will look for a certain kind of person to interview about a certain kind of thing, or will make sure that they have a uh, balanced story by stating you know, the finding or the claim, and then always, always finding a way to say, but some people think, this might not work out the way they've said, or some people think otherwise. Well, of course, some people do, but you know, it's they don't present it as an actual counterpoint. They present it as, well, we're making sure that this story is not a direct line in one way because we think stories should have a little a little question mark at the end, um, and maybe also we're covering our asses in case the the, the people who thought this initially were wrong. Um, so, you know, again, what I'm gonna say is as a response to that is the importance of diversifying our inputs, um, diversifying the kinds of stories we read, the kinds of people we listen to, uh, making sure that we are paying attention to our actual experience and to the experiences of other people who, who we trust as, as basing their, their writing or their reporting or their uh, stories of whatever kind on experience and evidence um, and using that to, to shape our worldview more than just, okay, I've seen a million movies where uh, someone walking down the street in a neighborhood full of people of color gets attacked. So I'm going to be really nervous right now, regardless of the fact that, you know, I have walked through many neighborhoods of people of color and never been attacked and in fact been helped when I'm in trouble. This, It's it's that sort of thing that we need to be really cautious about. And and being cautious is a start, like knowing in our brains that this is a story and that I've seen this a million times, that's a good start. Being aware of the effect of narratives is a good start, but really because narratives are so powerful, um, it's that we need to hear the narratives from different sides, from different perspectives, from different times, um, from different languages, from different places, uh, and from different people within our own cultures and languages. Absolutely.
wonderful. I mean, there's so much I want to pick up on in that. I'll just say for the for the group, if anyone would like to pose their own question, just just raise your digital hand. Um, I will toggle across the group so that I can spot you. Just to comment, um, uh, Malco, on your point about mass panic in a disaster. Um, I guess what behavioural research has shown is that two stories govern so much of our behaviour, two heuristic stories. You know, what did I do last time and what do most other people do? And so, yes, I've come across similar um, descriptions in the case of the, the Twin Towers, for example. Um, not many people died from panic. Fewer people died from panic than from walking too slowly down the many flights of stairs because of course the only time people had ever evacuated the buildings had been in a in a test situation um and so there wasn't panic if anything there was the opposite of of panic there was just too too slow a response um there's even a piece of research done when people are invited to participate in some research and they're told to wait in a waiting room before the research begins what they don't realize is that the experiment has already started um and some smoke starts to appear from under the door of the adjacent room to them and anyone who's on their own in the waiting room raises the alarm and leaves the building but if they put a stooge in the waiting room who just sits there calmly reading their magazine as if nothing was happening um, then people don't even leave and literally as the smoke is pouring into the waiting room they assume that because somebody else is perfectly calm about it there is no no reason to panic um so I think you're um, right, Malka, that we need to get out of um, the repetition of narratives and escape where narratives are holding us back. And one thing that you've done that was absolutely brilliant among your, your writing that I particularly liked was the short story Earthquake 2051. And what I found so exciting about that wasn't just the, the story, which is a brilliant, but the fact that it was commissioned by a newspaper for the humanitarian sector as a sort of way to provoke the sector into thinking about what it needs to do differently now. And I, I wonder if, you know, fiction as a tool is something that you've used in other ways specifically to sort of diagnose and change organizational responses in, in such a, a way. And if that is something that you feel might be replicated across other sectors in marketing, for example. You know, how might we think differently about the future and escape our repeated narratives through intentional fiction? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think it's a tool that can be used. And I've written other stories that were commissioned um, for specific reasons. I wrote a story that um, Consumer Reports asked for about like uh, community data around particularly insurance, disaster insurance. Um, for example, as one and a, and a couple of others. And it is, I think, a useful tool. I, I will say that I think it's, it is tricky. Um, I mean, it's tricky for me. And I think it's, it's especially tricky for people who don't write a lot of fiction, because it can be very hard to make points in fiction without coming across this really didactic, uh, boring, um, or, or close minded on it. And so it's it takes a lot of skill and there are people out there who do, you know there's there's a, a thing now called narrative design um there are a couple of other words for it you know there are people who who have the specific uh job of doing narrative for various reasons uh there's also i think you see it somewhat in a slightly different way in things like scenario planning as well um so i think there are a lot of organizations and and some businesses out there that are trying to figure out how to use narrative better but it is it is tricky. It's not the sort of thing where you can just sort of <laughs> whip up a story and and it will necessarily work the way you want it to. Um, and one thing, one of the the scary things about writing fiction too is that uh, it often, I think, even if you're very good at it, <laughs> it often tells people quite a lot about the person who's writing. Um, and so you know, there's it it can be quite revealing if someone's trying to do a particular a particular angle on things um which is again you know why it's it's useful to have one kind of an, an evidence base that you're working from uh and and to 
when you are thinking, particularly when you're trying to think about futures, you're trying to think about, um, you know, an industry uh, that you have narratives from lots of different perspectives within that industry or about that future. So that it's not just me who has one perspective on, on international aid, writing a story about what the future could look like, but also um, a lot of other people who are coming from different perspectives. I think that would make it even stronger and more useful. Uh, multiple multiple pen portraits of the of the future. Um, Tom, you have your hand raised. Hi, Malka. Can I just say it's been an absolute pleasure to listen to you, um, and thank you for all these for for lots of very very interesting ideas. In the in the early part of of your um, comments tonight, you mentioned NGOs and their relationship with governments and how sort of governments use use them as as cover for their in various ways. Those of us in marketing, especially on the brand side of marketing, we we sometimes occasionally have the opportunity to get uh, people in the commercial world and people who uh, in, in certainly who are, who are using technology and the building technology to consider their mission and values and how these things, these technologies should best be deployed. Do you think that technology if, if we think about NGOs as, as institutions, do you think we should be using technology uh, to improve our existing NGO sector institutions? Or should we be using it to bypass them and look at a different form of sort of commissioning, if you like, of aid that could happen in country that would actually connect donors in the West with people actually you know taking taking more agency for their own solutions in different parts of the world is that more valuable than than keeping those gatekeepers in place would you say what do you think is optimal i mean this is this is definitely a kind of both neither question answer for me um first of all because technology is super broad and secondly ngo work is super broad and and need so you know i think there are some kinds of assistance and work where NGOs have over time really built up a great store of knowledge and how to do them where specific NGOs will have really uh, deep networks and um, really excellent staff and trained people at all levels and just know what they're doing and technology can be helpful in facilitating that. And like, yes, uh, maybe we would also like to overturn the world order and have things be a little more equal and uh, erase national debt, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, in the world that we live in, um, there are a lot that that know what they're doing and are doing it pretty well and and technology can be helpful. There are places where it's it's good to to bypass them. Um, but it's hard to know that until you're, you know, looking at it closely. I think there's a real danger in saying, oh, we're going to disrupt this and uh, make it better when you don't actually have have the knowledge. I do think generally going as local as you can is always good, um, almost always good. Let's just let's just hedge that a little. But you know, and and there are a lot of local and national level NGOs that could definitely use technological help and have much less access to it through other means than the in, the big internationals do. And so sometimes that's a really good route to go. But again, you know, depending on the context, there are times when it's the government that makes that really difficult. There are times when, um, you know, there's a lot of examples throughout international aid of people plunking down a big technological gift that's great, but without maintenance and, you know, really time intensive training on how to use it properly, it doesn't end up helping the way that it should. Uh, and so a long-term NGO, even if it's international, can sometimes be the way to bridge that gap. Now, if there's other ways, if it's, it's a technology firm that's really going to commit to spending the time and being in the place, it's great to go. And, a and more and more, you know, I think there has been a big push in the international community for localization, for trying to put the resources in local hands. And I think that should happen. <laughs> and I think that a lot of the barriers to that are largely gatekeeping and imaginary. One thing that I 
Okay. So I'll, I'll just say as, you know, as an author um, who has a lot of author friends and a lot of illustrator friends, I have a big resistance to the kind of LLM work that is happening a lot now. One of the things that I see from the kind of flip side, from, from talking to a lot of people who are not native English speakers, but have to deal with uh, organizations where English is the main language is this idea that, okay, if we use uh, this kind of language generator, it can bridge that gap for us. And it can mean that our emails or our applications sound like we're the kind of people they want to fund. Mm -hmm. But the problem there is not with those people's English. The problem there is with the gatekeeping that says, we're going to give, we're going to look at all these applications and then the one with all the buzzwords and the nicely formed sentences uh, and phrasing, that one sounds better to us. It sounds more trustworthy. It sounds like the people we want to be working with. Um, so, you know, I would, I would much rather see that change than give all those people <laughs> wonderful LLM technology, especially because I'm fairly confident that the gatekeeping will be able to keep up with that and find ways to exclude mm -hmm. those using it. So um, I think there, but again, you know, that's one technology example. I think there's lots of technology that's really applicable to the problems that people have that can go straight to the local level um, that is not creating that sort of extra, extra thing. Um, so <laughs> I think it's just the question is super broad and it needs to be really a, a contextual one. Thank you. Sorry, that's not more helpful to say. No, no, it's good. Tell people to do, but um, it's, I think, I've been in a lot of situations as a, an NGO worker where there were rich people coming in who felt like they had the bright idea that would solve stuff and knew better than anyone else. And sometimes it was a great idea. Usually, even with a great idea, they had to work at least initially with some people on the ground, whether those were local people or, or NGOs who had spent a lot of time there. Um, and sometimes it wasn't that great an idea to begin with. I suppose the question I was really asking was whether it's, whether it's technology uh, whether it's money, um, whether it's it's just the should the should we be seeking the flow mm. of assets closer to the source rather than propping up the sort of you know the Western institutions because of their problems that Western governments create for them? Is that is that just a which are the is the better rough direction of travel? I mean, I would say generally localization. Generally, yes, we yep. do want to be getting the resources to the people who are closer to the ground, but it has to be done with care. Um, and it has to be done with, with some attention to the context. Uh, I'm also going to say that as a disaster researcher, particularly, and, and I think I'm more and more generally convinced of this, money and technology can both be extremely useful. But the thing that I have found that makes the difference in disasters um, is organization. And by organization, maybe maybe I'm meaning more community as well. Mm -hmm. um, we see this again and again in personal experience in literature. You can have a, you know, if you if you have no money, but you have community and organization, uh, you're far better off than the other way around, than having a lot of money and a community that where people are very divided and hate each other and no organization in terms of what to do with the money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, technology, I think you have to look at, is that technology supporting community and organization or is it supporting uh, profits or information or whatever it is being funneled into a particular place, whether that place is, you know, the person who invented the technology or whether it's mm -hmm. a small subset of local elites who got it first and are finding ways to exploit it. Um, so I think turning the question around a little bit to think about, you know, is this, and by community and organization too, like, okay, the local one is obviously really important, especially after disasters when you're usually cut off, but, but it also means, are we creating a community that that in an organization that says the people who are receiving are really connecting on a more or less equal level to the people who are giving. Because one of the huge problems in the aid industry is that not only is it perpetuating all this stuff, it's also perpetuating the idea that some places and people and structures are better than others. 
and that we go in and help and we go in and give, I mean, in all honesty, in all my work in human, I like, I feel like I learned so much more. Like it was, it was so developing and fulfilling for me. And, you know, I hope I did some good. I really do. And I was really trying to, and I was not like, you know, this is my adventure and I'm just doing that. No, you know, I was there to try and help, but I, I learned so much more from the people I work with. Uh, I hope I gave back and they learned some from me, not just in the sense of the sort of capacity building that I was officially doing, but also just in me telling them about what my life was like at home or in the other places I'd worked or just what I found interesting about their place and the food that I loved or hated or whatever. Um, so I think that also that sense of like building a connection between the people on different sides of this huge um, gulf of living standards that we've created mm -hmm. and these huge gulfs of, of life experience that we've created. And that is another part of organization and community that is that is so important. And that if we think about, you know, is the money contributing to that? Is the technology contributing to that? Mm -hmm. You know, over, obviously over and on top of dealing with urgent life-saving needs and urgent human dignity needs in, in disasters. But but even there, you know, even there, it really makes a difference uh, in the long-term effects. Because, and we've seen, you know, we've seen places where uh, huge amounts of aid money flooding in has turned incredibly toxic in the long term, just really has caused big problems for the places where where this has happened. And so, you know, thinking about that and, and how it is more about, you know, community and, and connection. I think it's so important. Yeah. Um, there's so much we could dig into on on technology. There have been periods when, you know, the transition to mobile did so much in mm -hmm. disasters, you know, things like frontline SMS, better communication of what's actually happening. Um, farmers across Africa better knowing where they can sell their produce. Um, today, the question is whether AI can really boost that kind of a step forward when so many places that are the most exposed to disasters are also not supported by AI and don't have the big data servers and don't have connectivity that will enable AI in the way that they have mobile connectivity. But as I, I'm conscious that we're... Again, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say to that again, you know, I think with all of these technologies, it's not just what they can do, but but how they are structured. And I'm going to you know, talking about mobile, we can think about Twitter because Twitter was an amazing tool for public safety, disaster response, disaster preparedness, early warning. I mean, there are incredible stories um, of how connections were made for things that particularly because it it works so well on mobile from low bandwidth areas or or clogged um, disaster areas. Yeah, um, technology, um, telecommunications clogged areas where everyone was trying to to make contact, and now it's not because there because there's a cost for API, which means that a lot of the early warning and weather services are no longer using it um, because it's been clogged with bots and other things, making it harder to find the information that people need. Um, and so, you know, it's not just the technology. It's the way that we structure the technology, the way that we structure access to the technology, um, the way that we think about where the benefits are going and, and also where the costs are going. Um, there's a wonderful book uh, called uh, by Deb Chatra, who's a, a, a professor um, about infrastructure. Um, how infrastructure works. And one of the things that she writes about is how so much of the infrastructure in the modern world is designed to put externalities somewhere else, uh, which is, again, part of the reason we need international assistance, because we put a lot of the externalities from the things that we benefit from somewhere else. And we continue to do that over and over again, whether it's things like plastic waste or things like pollution, um, or even things like the resources that we extract in order to make our iPhones and uh, to power AI and servers. Um, and so making sure that we consider those externalities when we think about the design of technology, even when it's technology intended to help, uh, I think is really important in moving towards a world that's that's 
better for everyone. Yeah, well, that's a a, a powerful conclusion. I'm I'm conscious that we're at the end of the the time that we've arranged with you. Um, is there anything you want to say in terms of your own thinking of the future, in terms of the future of Malka Older or the future of Global Voices? And and then we'll, well then I'll wrap up. Well, I will say that I I joined Global Voices. I just started, you know, five weeks ago, so it's it's quite a recent move for me. Um, but the reason I joined it was because I really do feel that among all the things that we can be doing to make the world a better place, uh, one of the most important is making sure that we hear the voices of people who are usually ignored in most of the news and media. So, um, again, people from all over the world, including places that are not in the middle of a crisis uh, or some kind of geopolitical scandal, um, and including people who don't speak or write in English, um, which is why we have a lot of, of translation going on on the site. Uh, and that it's and and the communities that are underrepresented on the internet. So we have a lot of work with indigenous communities and minority language groups to see about how digital rights can be fully extended to their communities. Um, and and you know, I, I think that's important. I always feel like there's this this sort of double um pull with this this organization, which is, you know, part of it is the importance of the people who are telling the stories and making sure we get them out there. But the other half part of it is the readers, right? The other part of it is making sure that people have access to these stories from all over the world about all sorts of things, including breaking news and crises, but also including um, long traditions of how you take tea and uh, the the stories of, you know, a, a weightlifter who became famous um, from West Africa and the stories of uh, a, a band that's trying to 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 raise questions about um, gender rights with metal, heavy metal from the Balkans. Or, you know, we have just this wide range of stuff that are the things that people want people to know about. And I just think that when we look at how narrow uh, a lot of the news media is and how focused it is on certain kinds of stories, it's, it's really important to have this in the world. So I am trying to keep that site running and doing good things for <laughs> both the the writers and the readers. Um, I'm continuing to write my books. I have my latest series. Uh, I have a contract for, well, there's um, three more coming. One is done, one is started, one is not started. Uh, and I'm I'm working on writing about my predictive fictions class from that I teach as well, hopefully. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm very busy. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to that latter point that I, I didn't know would be made available because I'm fascinated by how we can see um, non-fiction predictive writing alongside fictional predictive writing and how they can inform each other. So I, I definitely want to sign up to that. I want to encourage everyone to check out Global Voices. They can also sign up to get your curated um selection of stories each week i want to make one small request for a future character so in the sentinel cycle trilogy marketing does feature in terms of election campaigns customized advids content sweatshops um i would like to see a character in one of the novels at some point who um deploys marketing in the sense of genuinely trying to seek what is human need and how can we better fulfill it? Um, if they were in the Sentinel cycle, they'd probably end up working for policy first. Um, I want to recommend uh, all of um, Malka's writing. Of course, Infomocracy in the Sentinel cycle is an obvious place to start. Um, a, a more of a hidden gem that I've fallen in love with um, is the prior collection of short stories and poetry called Dot 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 and Other Disasters. Um, it's just such a soulful collection, posing beautiful questions. I mean, if if you could have a a video of all of your memories as they're created, who would you share it with? What would happen after you were no longer alive? You know, what would happen if we created not artificial intelligence but artificial artificial emotion? What would the implications be? I found that this is a book that you can dip into read and then you just have to stop <laughs> you know Malka's work is also page turning but the ideas are so rich that you also have to stop 
and pause and reflect and think. Um, so I particularly also recommend beginning with and other disasters. Um, we have a couple of gatherings coming up to mention. So we have a Your Marketing Kind discussion led by Neil Davidson on the use of AI in creative agencies. Um, I don't have the date of that actually in my notes, but it will be um, on our website. Um, on October 24th, we have our next Coffee with a Cause uh, with the Oasis Trust that will be led by Caroline Taylor. Um, and our next exchange um, is with the economist and former editor-in-chief of the Observer newspaper, Will Hutton, on the narratives that we can use to remake Britain. So that will be another phenomenal exchange on November 14th. For anyone who's not yet a member of Marketing Kind, you can find out more about the benefits of joining us at marketingkind.org. Um, and Malka, uh, thank you so much for today. Thank you for being so brilliant. Thank you for already deserving a lifetime award for such a huge oeuvre, um, uh, even though you're at such an early stage in life, which is intimidating for the rest of us. Um, and thank you so much again for your time today. Well, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. It's really been a pleasure and especially thanks for the great question. Um, but thank you all for listening. Thank you. See you again.